Welcome to the reading of the Spirits book. We are talking about the introduction, uh, part three. So we talked about the definitions and on part three, Kardec is going to start talking about the methodology. So he says, like every theory, this, this Spiritism has followers and det detractors, right? And then he starts explaining how he went about the study, being a studious person. Kardec went into research and he explains a little bit here. He talks about the target. We will turn our attention to those of good faith who are without preconceptions or set minds, but who sincerely desire, desire to learn. We will prove to them that most of their objections of spiritism are the result of an incomplete observation of the factual events and a judgment formed too quickly and too rashly. So he goes into explaining how, you know, the table turning. So he talks about the tables. They were called dance of the tables, table turning. This was the terminology that was used back then. He talked about how common it was and it happened in a multitude of places. So there was a lot of observations into that. And if he was only limited to the movement of physical objects, it might have been explained by some purely physical cause. So the first thing he tried to understand is what was the cause. Uh, was that, that unusual that tables would move? Well, maybe there was an explanation for it. He said, well, we know the earth moves. We know that you know things move. So maybe there's a reason that we don't know. Maybe there's a natural cause to that. So they were looking to magnetism and other things. Well, however, um, it was something beyond that because they, there wasn't uh, something that was... Um, frequent, there was all the same, the movements changed, there was a lot of variety into that. It says the, the, the movement wasn't always circular, for example. And nobody was really interested in paying much attention to it. There are people that were fascinating and having fun with that, but this, and he says here, superior minds were sometimes too frivolous and felt it too belittling to concern themselves with what was commonly called the dance of the table. So it was just like, I won't even bother with it. And here's something uh, very special that I think uh, distinguishes Kardec from a lot of others. He says, however, a few individuals were humble enough to admit that nature might not have given them its final word and they wanted to observe the matter for themselves in, in order to set their minds at ease. Look at the humility of Kardec to say, I don't know what it is, but before judging it, I'm going to study. I will take the time and I will study it into the de a detail without it before coming to a conclusion. I think this is, um, Kardec is, is always somebody I admire and I say that often because he's incredibly intelligent um, and and you know knowledgeable of a lot of things you know we can see that back in the day where he wrote the book how much knowledge he has but what really touches my heart is his humility because he said i don't know but i am willing to study and i am ready for whatever answer i will encounter and then he goes on to to study if that could be a fraud um, and he says, yes, of course, that, that would be fraud. Fraud is present everywhere. But just the fact that some people misuse something doesn't disqualify that something. And he says here, an educated person might see in a phys physicist's experiments only the tricks of a deft magician. Are we to deny physics simply because there are magicians who call themselves phys physicists? So then he goes into, um, we need to go beyond a one manifestation on one person. We also need to look at the source and where it comes from. If thinking of um, if we receive um, a phone call uh, and somebody may be asking us for our bank account number and all of that, just because we're re talking to somebody doesn't mean that the person is telling us something that's good and that's right. We need to always evaluate. We need to always study. And that's Kardec's invitation use logic and reason but take the time to go and study so here he explains what triggered his curiosity and his interest because in the beginning he wasn't really interested in those things but 
when he starts seeing that there was something else, he went beyond that. So then we move into part four, where he talks about the cause and the method. So if the phenomena we are considering had been limited only to the movement of objects, they would have remained within the domain of physical sciences. Then later he says, the impulse given to the objects was not simply the product of some blind mechanical force. He is getting to the point of the source and there was an intelligence cause because the, answer, the tables were answering intelligent questions. They were saying yes or no, tapping once or twice and all of that. Um, this opened the way to an entirely new field of observation. That was his first main conclusion is to say, well, an intelligence answer comes from an intelligent source. It cannot be the table that's talking anymore. And that opened a completely new field of explanation. So the biggest um, conclusion of Kardec was that an intelligence response had an intelligence cause. And here, and here he says that he opened a completely new field of observation because it was just a material thing. Any science could go in and study, okay, something new occurred, we didn't know of this mechanism, you know, maybe it's something that has to do with magnetism, let's study that. But he said, this is something different. So, and then he talks about how often they was and how many times they observed. And these were things that were happening in multiple places in the world simultaneously. So he talks about the United States, France, several other countries that were letters and all the explanations of things and, and the descriptions and, and the pictures were pretty similar into what was happening. Then he explains a little bit about a pencil was attached to a basket and the, the pencil would write uh, answers to what people were asking. Um, the interesting thing is that almost at the same time, these different places, that suggestion came up, right? Um, then he talks about the medium. So he says that the basket would move or, or the pencil would move, however, except under the influence of certain persons gifted with a special ability. So there was a, a certain type of intermediary uh, had to be present for these uh, things to manifest. And then he calls them mediums, uh, which is the, uh, is the medium between spirits and humans. The condition that produced this ability are linked both to physical and moral ca causes they are still not fully understood. Mediums are of all ages, of both genders, and of all degrees of intellectual development. Moreover, the faculty can be developed further by exercising it. So this is what he then, um, first is he noticed that there was an intelligence source, that it wasn't the tables that were talking. Then he went on to see, well, it's happening in a multitude of places and he could observe some of them and the others he heard through letters um, and descriptions. And then he saw that a specific kind of medium needs to be present um, to be able to facilitate that um, or enable that manifestation. So then it's, he goes into a little bit of his method. Then he Part five, he starts talking about the development of psychography. So he talks about um, that they, you know, looking to the, the pencil next to the basket, attached to the basket, and people would just, the, the pencil would move by itself. They started to notice that um, the pencil could be just, you know, um, the medium could be holding the pencil and it would just write. And then he explains how that came about. Um, and then, of course, he could, they could see that there were different answers depending on the, on the spirit that was talking, right? He, he continues checking and he, he starts to say, okay, could this be this, could this be that? The whole time he's looking to what other things could it be? Could it come from the medium himself as well? In some observations, the, the answers that they were having were way beyond the capability of the medium. A lot of the, some of the mediums were even children. so. The questions they were asking were even mental questions that they were asking, or uh, they would ask questions in another language, and also they could see a different handwriting come. Um, so, you know, depending on, on who was giving the answer. In some cases, the responses reveal a level of wisdom, depth, and timeliness 
and the thoughts are so elevated and sublime that they could only have come from a higher intelligence imbued with the purest morality. At other times, they are so flippant, so frivolous, so banal, that reason refuses to accept the possibility that they could have come from the same source. Such diversity of language can only be explained by the diversity of the intelligences that manifest in themselves. Are these intelligences human or not? That is the point to clarify, and for which a complete explanation is conveyed in the spirits themselves will be found in this book. So he's explaining now that um, not only he found that the spirits could communicate, so that was the intelligence. So when he, when he asked first was who is talking and, and the answer was I'm a spirit or a genius, whatever you want to call me. So he started having this, you know, going further on his investigations and he's talking about what was happening in all over the world and the messages he was getting. Then he goes into a second part, the variety of the answers. And he goes into, he used one tool that was um, uh, pretty interesting was the language. So he could differentiate who was speaking by the language they use, the content of the message. Kardec was the first person to categorize spirits. So before him, of course, communications with the other world has always existed. We find that in ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, and it's something common. But as well as in the realm of mystery, and in the realm of the unknown, or supernatural, or madness, but he actually starts to see, well, these things are natural. They occur. And then he started to notice the difference, the, diverse, the, the, the diversity of the spirits. It makes sense. If we were to pick up the phone and call um, a planet, let's say that we could call the Earth from another planet that we were, and we wanted just to verify that we could talk to somebody, depending on who picked up the phone, we would get a completely different answer. We could have somebody that would answer and say, oh, the Earth is flat, I'm the king of this planet, and you know, could tell us all, all sorts of things. But just for the fact of this person being communicated doesn't mean that the content is accurate. So he started to, to, to distinguish between um, the good, the responses, and he talks about the level of wisdom, the thoughts are elevated, and the language that they use as well. Then he goes here to say these effects necessarily have a cause, and since they reveal the action of an intelligence and a will, they are outside the physical realm. So he just concludes here that many theories have been formulated on the matter. We will examine them briefly to see if they can render comprehensible all the facts that have surfaced. In the meantime, however, let us accept the existence of beings distinct from humankind, since that is the explanation given by the intelligence themselves. And let us see what they might have to tell us. So this is the end of chapter 5 or part 5 of the Introduction of the Spirits book. Thank you for being with us. See you next time. Mm -hmm.